Hey everybody, Marcus here. Feminist ethics is an attempt to revise, reformulate, or rethink traditional ethics to the extent it depreciates or devalues women's moral experience. Feminists believe that traditional models of ethics let down women in five ways. Firstly, it shows less concern for women's as opposed to men's issues and interests. Secondly, traditional ethics views as trivial the moral issues that arise in the so-called private world, the realm in which women do housework and take care of children, the infirm, and the elderly. Third, it implies that, in general, women are not as morally mature or deep as men. Fourth, traditional ethics overrates culturally masculine traits like independence, autonomy, intellect, will, wariness, hierarchy, domination, culture, transcendence, product, asceticism, war, and death, while it underrates culturally feminine traits like interdependence, community, connection, sharing, emotion, body, trust, absence of hierarchy, nature, imminence, process, joy, peace, and life. Fifth, and finally, it favors male ways of moral reasoning that emphasize rules, rights, universality, and impartiality over female ways of moral reasoning that emphasize relationships, responsibilities, particularity, and partiality. Now, right out the gate, we can immediately see the relationship between feminist ethics and the contents of my two previous series on feminism. For those who have not watched my other two series, I strongly recommend you turn off this video and watch Feminism Part 1, Women's Way of Knowing, followed by Feminist Epistemology Part 1, The Situated Knower. Once you have watched those two videos, please return and once again listen to the five points I have just listed. Point 5 is clearly a call towards the division between vertical and lateral thinking. Points 2 and 4 are clearly referring to the situated knower as presented in Feminist Epistemology. Now, in this series, I will cover two feminist ethical approaches care-focused approaches to feminist ethics, and status-focused approaches to feminist ethics. I may also decide to cover lesbian ethics as the last part of this series. And yes, there is such a thing as lesbian ethics. Now, in this video, I will be covering an overview of ethics and a brief history of feminist ethical thought. At the root of it, each feminist ethical approach attempts to address one or more of the five points I had listed above. Now, Ethics is a core area of philosophy. In fact, ethics is the most important concern of philosophers such as Plato and Nietzsche. It is the investigation of how human beings ought to behave, and not merely an attempt to describe how human beings in fact do behave. Ethics can be broken down into specific areas which in turn encompass certain types of questions. Metaethics, for example, concerns itself with the nature of the good and the ontological status of ethical values, you know, whatever form they may take. Normative ethics, on the other hand, is concerned with ethical systems that are developed based on certain commitments to meta-ethical claims. The three most prominent normative ethical systems are virtue ethics, which was developed and defended by Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, and much of Roman thought. Virtue ethics is governed by the cultivation of the cardinal virtues of prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. Deontology, which is a rule-based system fleshed out by Kant, governed by, well, the categorical imperative, namely, behave in such a way as that you wish your actions become a universal rule. And finally, utilitarianism, which was developed by Bentham and Mill. Utilitarianism is concerned with maximizing happiness for the greatest number. Now, consequentialism is another normative ethical model, but is not as prominent as the three mentioned so far. Lower than normative ethics, we have applied ethics. Now, applied ethics concerns itself with answering practical questions in relation to a normative ethical system. Politics and much discourse on the internet are usually engaged with applied ethics. A question in applied ethics would be as follows. Is abortion morally right in terms of, say, virtue ethics, or in terms of deontology, or in terms of utilitarianism? And finally, we have descriptive ethics. 
Descriptive ethics is merely the activity of cataloging ethical systems and values of different cultures and time periods. It is something that, well, anthropologists engage in and serves as background information to fuel higher order ethical thought found in normative and metaethical discourse. Now, the key question that should be kept in mind is where can feminist ethics be positioned in this ordering? To me, it seems like feminist ethics fluctuates between metaethics and normative ethics. It engages with questions, well, like the following. Are there such things as male ethics and female ethics? Can virtues be specific to men while others specific to women? Should both men and women adhere to the same ethical standards or do they have their own unique paths? Now, Mary Wollstonecraft, a proto-feminist who I discussed in my video entitled Feminism Part 3, Blame the French, concluded that moral virtue is unitary. Women, she said, are obligated to practice the same morality men practice, that is, human morality. Wollstonecraft denied that women are doomed by nature to be less virtuous than men. Deprived of sufficient opportunities to develop their rational powers, women wind up being overly emotional, hypersensitive, narcissistic, self-indulgent individuals. Wollstonecraft said there's nothing wrong with women, including their supposedly weak moral characters that cannot be cured by a rigorous education. That is, the kind of education that aims to develop students' rational powers. Men have concerns, causes, and commitments over and beyond petty, self-interested ones because they receive a proper education. Give women men's education, said Wollstonecraft, and women, no less than men, will become morally mature human beings. Whereas parents teach boys morals, they teach girls manners. More generally, society as a whole encourages women to cultivate negative psychological traits like cunning, vanity, and immaturity, all of which impede women's moral development. Worse, society twists what could be women's virtues into vices. Wollstonecraft specifically claimed, for example, that women's positive psychological trait of gentleness is quickly transformed into the negative psychological trait of obsequiousness. When it is the submissive demeanor of dependence, the support of weakness that loves because it wants protection and is forbearing because it must silently endure injuries, smiling under the lash at which it dare not snarl. Now, Feminist discussions about what makes a human being good did not end with Wollstonecraft, but continued into the next century. By the 19th century, women were regarded as more moral, though also as less intellectual than men, a view that disturbed utilitarian philosopher John Stuart Mill. As he saw it, society is mistaken to set up an ethical double standard according to which moral, women's morality is to be assessed differently than men's morality. Reflecting on women's alleged moral superiority, Mill concluded that women's morality is simply the result of systemic social conditioning. To laud women on account of their complex abnegation of themselves is merely to complement society for inculcating in women those psychological traits that serve to maintain it. Women are taught to live for others, to always give and never take, to submit, yield, and obey, to be long-suffering. They are also taught to demur to men because they are not as smart and strong as men. This being the case, women's virtue is not the product of autonomous choice. Rather, it is the consequence of social programming. At root, there is but one virtue, human virtue, and women as well as men should be pushed to adhere to its standards. Then, and only then, will society be as just and prosperous as possible. Now, other 19th century thinkers denied that virtue is, or should be, the same for both sexes. Instead, they provided a separate and equal theory of virtue according to which male and female virtues are simply different. Or, they elaborated a separate and unequal theory of virtue according to which female virtue is fundamentally better than male virtue. Importantly, this diverse group of thinkers disagrees amongst themselves about how to assess the characteristic, namely nurturance, empathy, compassion, self-sacrifice, kindness, you know, typically associated with women. They ask themselves whether these feminine characteristics 
are one, genuine moral virtues to be developed by men as well as by women, two, positive psychological traits to be developed by women alone, or three, negative psychological traits not to be developed by anyone. Catherine Beecher, an American educator who lived between 1800 and 1878, was among this group of thinkers. She thought that women's place was in the home. Unlike some of her contemporaries, however, she thought that women's work, understood as the creation and maintenance of strong families in which moral virtue thrives, was essential for society's well-being. In an effort to help society properly esteem women's work, Beecher developed the discipline of domestic science. She stressed that women's housework requires much intelligence as well as many organizational and occupational skills. It may be just as demanding to manage a large household, for example, as it is to manage a small business. Beecher also emphasized that women's most important work is to make the members of her family like Christ, who died a painful death so that humankind could be redeemed from its fallen sinful state. Insulated in the private realm, where they are supposedly deaf to the siren's call of worldly wealth, power, and prestige, women are supposedly better situated than men to cultivate the Christ-like virtue of self-denying benevolence and to serve as role models for their families. The more pure and perfect women are, the better society will be. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, an American suffragist who lived between 1815 and 1902, also saw differences between women's and men's moralities. Although Stanton was not certain whether what she perceived as men's and women's diverging virtues and vices were the result of social manipulation or biological imperative, she knew that men's morals, of which she had a generally low opinion, had set the standard for behavior in the public world. The solution to this quote-unquote, regrettable state of affairs, said Stanton, was a relatively simple one. Push women and their superior morals into the public world. Humankind cannot afford to leave women, as Beecher would say, in the private world, exerting their good influence there and only there. Now, as we have observed, the apotheosis of woman is already contained in the words and thoughts of ethicists leading back to the 17th century. The idea of women's moral superiority was juxtaposed against a universal ethical system stemming in, well, one way or another, from God or some higher source like the form of the good in Platonism. The idea of absolute morality has all but been dismissed by most non-religious people. There are many MGTOW who believe that morality is relative, that it is something we just make up. Well, of course, no one so far putting forward this meta-ethical claim has yet to justify it. But whether or not this is true, there is a much more immediate concern. The proliferation of the belief that this claim indeed is true. By relativizing morality, humanity makes itself the arbiter of moral values. If this is the case, and men defer to women through the gynocentric nature of our species, then humanity is setting itself up to make women the arbiters of morality. The proliferation of the idea that morality is relative, true or not, plays itself right into the hands of women. In the videos that follow in this series, what we will come to see is the form of morality that is becoming the morality of the herd, the morality of the Western world. Through exploring the care-focused and the status-focused approaches to feminist ethics, we will witness the rhetoric of politicians, social justice warriors, and the blue pill man in general. Now, though my series on modernity is not getting lots of views as, well, the subject matter perhaps being somewhat boring, it is a series that contributes to providing explanatory force as to why these shifts in thought are taking place. The historical figures in that work are the same players who set the stage for feminist ethics to emerge. It is all related, and by watching those videos, you will gain better context in what will be discussed in this series. But for now, thanks for listening. Go team.